We are ready to start and have our speaker this morning. This morning, it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Mr. Kevin Buck, who will speak to us about sacred encounters, conversation, conversations with others. Please welcome Kevin Buck. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can we hear you? Okay, yeah. we're good. All right. Good morning. What I'd like to do is I would like to uh, tell you a quick little story and then unpack the rest of the talk with you. Okay. So a sacred encounter for me was uh, when I was uh, 16 years of age, uh, I had decided that I was going to be pre-med because I wanted to be a physician. And uh, I took a class to be a certified orderly. And uh, you had to be 18 to work in acute care. So I was working in then what was called a convalescent hospital in the mid-70s. I'd work on weekends and I walked into a room and uh, Frank was there and I noticed Frank was, seemed to be bedridden and he had a urinal next to his, uh, his bed there. And so my question to him was, do you use the urinal? And he said, no. And then I just said, would you like to? And he said, yes. And that started a transformation. He had been listed as incontinent no one had been offering him that opportunity. We eventually got him, uh, I worked on weekends, uh, I would come in and I would write notes about what needed to happen for Frank during the week, even though I was 16 years of age, I was a little bit uh, uh, arrogant in that sense, uh, but uh, I, I thought I knew better. And uh, we eventually got Frank to sit up, we eventually got him to walking, and on one weekend, I came in on a Friday night, and Frank wasn't there. That's always a little disturbing in a convalescent hospital. Um, but the true story is, is Frank walked out. <laughs> Frank left. So a little conversation about do you use a urinal, and would you like to, ended up being a transformative experience for him but it was also a transformative experience for me because it helped me see that actually having that kind of interaction with people can have incredible effect on their life and also on my life. So, as a context, what I want to do is I want to talk about mystery, I want to talk about sacred encounters, and then I want to talk about collaborative conversations. So mystery, God, spirit, the divine. How many of you, show of hands, believe that you completely understand who God is? <laughs> <clears throat> How many of you believe that God is a mystery? Okay. So. How many of you believe we're created in the image and likeness of God? Okay. So we're a mystery too. Okay. So, you are an unrepeatable combination of God's gifts. There never has been, there isn't now, nor will there ever be anyone who possesses the combination of gifts that you possess. Therefore, your full participation in this world is absolutely essential. There is no replacement or substitute for you. So just let that sink in for a bit. That's who you are. You are that unrepeatable combination of God's gifts. There is no replacement for you. No one before, during this time, or after will be anywhere near who you are and what you have to offer to this world. And therefore, your full participation is absolutely essential. We need you, is the bottom line. And part of that is kind of recognizing the giftedness of ourselves and the mystery of who we are within ourselves and recognizing that divine. If you're a mystery, 
then the best way for me to approach you is with awe and curiosity. The mystics have always said that the best way to approach the divine is with awe, and sometimes they use the word unknowing. There's an unknow unknowing that happens. And the great thing about that is if I approach you as a mystery, then I come to realize that I never will understand who you are, ever. Well, and part of that is, is that you're constantly evolving. You're a moving target to begin with. You know, so I can never get you figured out, so to speak, because you're constantly changing and evolving. And so that I can let go of that agenda. Of, of any sense of like, I will figure you out and know who you are. So, so you can let go of that. Just take a deep breath. <laughs> and I'll let go of that agenda of figuring anyone out. Because they're essentially a mystery. Now if I approach you with a sense of curiosity, what that does is it means that I have the ability to ask you questions about yourself. Because I never know who you are. I don't know if that's true. It may have been true last week. It may not be true this week. But I don't know that until I actually inquire with you and see if that's true for you now. The other piece is, is that I know that I can never then have certainty. And actually certainty in a relationship is one of the most disruptive things that you can do. Because what does that mean? <clears throat> it means that I no longer see you as a mystery and I think I've got you figured it out, all figured out. So here's the other piece. Not only do you get to see the other person as a mystery, you need to let go of certainty. I'll never have certainty about that person. OK, so I don't. There you go. You have certainty about God or the divine in your life? Maybe not. <coughs> so, so you can let go of that, too. It becomes uh, very easy. <clears throat> The other thing about the other person is uh, <clears throat> I've been a speaker for <clears throat> most of my professional life. And my, my daughter, who's 33, Sarah, she's my oldest daughter, her favorite uh, dad quote is, <clears throat> the most challenging thing about being in a relationship is coming to realize that the other person isn't you. <laughs> The most challenging thing about being in a relationship is coming to realize the other person isn't you. We are so self-referenced, you know? And it's not so much that my wife does things, and I'm curious about how, why she does it that way. I'm mostly curious about why she doesn't do it my way, <laughs> what, what that curiosity is like. Because for most of us, and we truly do believe this, that the way that we're interacting in the world is the best way. I mean, why would I do it any other way? I'm, I'm a person of excellence. I would want to find the most excellent way of doing it. I model that all the time, and I can't figure out why some people just don't seem to have picked up on this better way of being in the world. And uh, the bottom line is they're just different than I am. And so if I, if I hold that as a standard, that my way is the best way, then it's always going to put me in a little bit of a disadvantage. Because then I will have lost a sense of mystery. And uh, I was talking to someone before uh, the meeting, and, and part of this was like letting go of blaming others. And sometimes that blaming is really about just being different. I see you as a different person. And it's like, OK, different is good. We're all different. Did I mention you're a unique combination of God's gifts? <laughs> so that's at the very beginning. It's all grounded in that. So when we, we take a look at that, we kind of look at the, what is the sacred encounter? The sacred encounter is the fact that when we have a conversation with the other, whether that other is God or another human being, then that's also a sacred space of mystery. So here's the reality for us. As much as over the years I've maybe <clears throat> gone away and done silent retreats or any other kinds of experiences in my life, the reality is the place that I encounter God the most is with other people. That's where we live in. It's not so much if you think about it in a vertical and a horizontal. It's really that I experience God most in the horizontal, right here, 
interacting with other folks. <coughs> this is where I have the opportunity to practice it all the time. It happens all the time for me. And so if I see you as a mystery, and if I see myself as a mystery, and I see myself as a unique combination of God's gifts, then it allows me to enter into that conversation in a different way. When I was a, a therapist, one of the things that I would uh, try to pay attention to, and especially when I, I taught graduate school at Pepperdine for 12 years, and teaching therapists is that when you bring someone into your presence, you have to ask yourself whether or not there's room for them. Have I created a space for you? Is there a place for you to be present with me? If I don't create that space within myself, and within my being and within my heart, then you feel that lack of hospitality. Now, there's a language about hospitality for the stranger. And so do I invite you into a space where you feel like it can be comfortable? Or, as we sometimes experience, you can be invited into someone's office and it's rather cluttered. And they say, go ahead and have a seat. And you're kind of like, I'm not sure where. I mean, you know, and then they're scattering. You all oh, here, let me pull this away from this chair and put these books over here and so on and so forth. And so you have a sense that it's not a welcoming space. And oftentimes that happens for us. And so to me, in order to have that kind of sacred encounter with another human being is, have I done the work to create a space within me where you feel my hospitality as soon as we come together? Or have I cluttered a bit? <clears throat> and is it important for me to declutter a bit so that I can make space for you before we have that conversation? So I think that's one of the most important things that can happen when we interact in any kind of conversation. The other piece is, is that <clears throat> some of the clutter can be in our head about what it is what we need to say or not say, do or have done, or how the conversation should go, or whatever those things are. If that space is cluttered for us, then we won't have an evolving encounter with one another. We'll have something else, but it won't be as deep and as rich as it could be. So those, those are important things to just begin to kind of pay attention to. How do I enter into a conversation have I made space within myself? Have I, am I seeing the other person truly as a mystery? And, um, <clears throat> and where your curiosity is really about being curious about the other person and not by, about being curious about why they're not like you. Um, and then you have the opportunity to really have that hospitality of the stranger until you become friends. So we welcome each other as strangers for the first time until we have the opportunity to really connect or really, in, in, in the reality of it, is really reconnect. We're all connected to begin with. We just forget that we're connected. And so the hospitality for the stranger is just a way of creating a space where until I remember, and that's the reconnecting, remembering is reconnecting, until I remember that you are truly a friend of mine and that we are already connected to begin with. So, those are a few thoughts to begin with, and uh, one of the things that I like to do is I like to engage uh, people uh, in the work that we're doing, and even in this conversation. So, part of this is being collaborative. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have you do a table exercise, and we're gonna do it this way. It's a, it's a process called Liberating Structures. There's a website called liberatingstructures.com, and it's uh, what we call a one, two, four, all. And so all I'm going to ask you to do is to take a minute to think about something. So I'm going to pause you for a minute and ask you not to turn to anybody until you've had a chance to think. It's a reflective process. I'm going to ask you to share with the person next to you. And then as a group, share what you heard from each other. Okay? So one, two, and then we'll do a table. So it won't be so much a four. And then at the end of it, I want to kind of go around and hear what you had to say. Okay? So you're probably curious. Well, what is the question? I, I like that curiosity. That's a, that's a good sign already. 
So the question is, what do you think are the essential elements of a sacred encounter with somebody else? What do you think are those behaviors or practices that are essential to a sacred encounter for you? The reason I ask this is I often believe that I, I believe this is that I may be standing in the room, but there's more collective wisdom on the other side of me than there is standing right here. So I'd like to tap into that collective wisdom, and this is a way to do so. So I'm going to give you a minute. After a minute, I'm going to ring a chime. That's a, your sign to go to a two. I'll give you about two or three minutes, and then you'll go to a table. Now ring another chime, bring it back, and we'll check in with the tables. Questions? One minute by yourself, go, reflective. Find a partner. conversation as a, a table what were some of the things and here's what I'd like you to do I'd like you to share what you heard 
not so much what you said. So what did you hear as essential from your partner and share that as, at, at the table? should bring your attention back. So what about that collective wisdom at your table? Okay, very good. So what I want to do is I just want to go around real quick, maybe one, one or two things that stuck out for you uh, from your table. Anyone? Right here. So the idea that the other person isn't trying to fix us. <laughs> that we're just there to listen and accept, and non-judgment was an important point, and that the eyes were really important. And also, <clears throat> not only do you listen, but you 
feed back with empathy, and one of the best ways to do that is me too. I, I get that because I have something that I can relate to the same yeah. as you. Somebody else from another table? Something different? Yes. Well, I think what we started with was clearing ourselves and getting in touch with ourselves and our own inner voice, if you will, and quieting everything else down so that we can be totally receptive to whatever comes that way. Because if, if you're operating from some persona, whatever, you're not in contact with yourself, you're not going to have any, any kind of connection. Okay. Very good. Thank you. One other, maybe. <clears throat> Excellent. Hi. Yeah. So <laughs> our table, um, quite a few of us, we were saying openness. That mm. word came up a lot. Um, as well as, again, taking time to be still and setting an intention. And then we all also agreed on humor mm. and laughter and how, you know, something about when you can bring laughter and humor to a space, you, all the guards fall down. And I feel like that's when you really connect. And we, saw, we said that of all of those things, love is what it says that's space, so that was our Great. Thank you. Maybe one more? Just wanted to say something about the timing of a sacred encounter. It can happen in a flash or a moment. If you have eye contact with the person, there's a soul connection, we agreed. It can happen just like that, or it can happen over hours and hours of deeply connecting and resonating and aligning with another person. So the timing didn't have to have any special limits to it. That's right. That's right. Thank you. That's great. Great feedback. So, so to that point is that I, I, I have a good friend, uh, Lama Surya Das, who's a Tibetan Buddhist Lama, and he said enlightenment can happen in a moment or it can happen over a lifetime. So it, you know, we just don't know. It's, uh, it happens when it happens. So what I'd like to do is kind of give you a framework uh, around uh, sacred encounters. And um, in the business that I have, I take a look at three things. I'm a kind of a Trinitarian kind of guy. I like the three. So reflective, collaborative, and transformative. And so a rule around a sacred encounter is always being reflective about what is it that you want to have happen. Setting an intention, quieting down, being attentive. Um, one, of, one of my practices sometimes is to ask, is this a good time? Mm -hmm. Is this a good time? Because, uh, it, because if it's not, it's, it's not. And, and that's okay, but I, I, it's important to me, so I want to make sure it's a good time. And I don't want to assume just because I've broken into your life that it's a good time for you, just because it's a good time for me, so to speak. Um, the reflection also allows for the best of ourselves and others to emerge. So the quieting space allows us to also drop from our heads into our hearts. So one of the things people say, well, how do I know if I'm really in my heart? And I said, well, here's, here's what you can do. You can put your hand over your heart and see if you're there. <laughs> and and if, you're, if you're still up in your head, just allow your Self a moment to drop back into your heart. That's all it takes. It's kind of that simple. So if you think you're way too much in your head, just put your hand over your heart. Okay, I'm back. I'm back in my heart. All right, good. Good. <clears throat> so you can be collaborative. The other piece is not just to be um, reflective, but also collaborative. And, and this is really important in, in the work that I do uh, with a lot of people. Um, I was sharing with uh, someone earlier, if you would have told me when I was younger that I would be doing executive coaching with bishops and lamas, I would have thought that you were nuts. Um, how could something like that happen? Um, but that's part of what's happening. Part of that is kind of co-creating the space together. So, so this engagement, this talk, is really not just about me talking, but we've already co-created this experience together. And that's an important piece. So it's not always mine. This isn't my talk, per se. 
This is our experience together. So how do I want to invite you in to co-create this experience together? What does that begin to look like? And so much, we spend a lot of our time as individuals driving our own agendas and sometimes not creating something for people. So a way to know whether or not you're being collaborative is to really ask yourself a simple question. Am I doing something to someone or am I doing something with someone? Am I doing something to someone or am I doing something with someone? That's a, that's a distinction that helps you figure it out whether or not uh, I'm going to go have that talk with you. Well, not really with you, at you, I mean to you. Um, okay, well, but I, okay, I would like a with. <laughs> I'm glad you'll be there. I'll make it more like two of us. <laughs> so, the, the other thing is, is that when you're co-creative, you get to co-create the solutions, which is marvelous. They become opportunities. I didn't, I didn't do anything besides ask a question of Frank. And along the way, I was 16. I didn't know anything. What did I know at 16, for goodness sake? So we co-created the solution together over time. It just kind of evolved. It became an ongoing dialogue. And, uh, and it got to where it was, where he finally walked out of the place. And, and it just delights me to think that you know, I don't know what he ended up doing. But uh, it was so great that he walked out of that place. Transformative. So the key to being transformative is being vulnerable. You can't have transformation without vulnerability. It's just absolutely impossible. So there has to be an openness, a vulnerability, a space within your heart where you're willing to make room for things to be different. Um, I like to say, uh, not exactly what I expected is a phrase. Not exactly what I expected. So that, that vulnerability also acknowledges that change is the constant in relationships. So again, I can't have the certainty. If you can let go of the certainty and have the curiosity and recognize the mystery, then the vulnerability becomes a lot easier. Because I've let go that I'm going to have certainty around this anyway. <laughs> or that I'm in control or in charge or any of those kind of wild and crazy ideas. <laughs> the other piece is that vulnerability allows you to engage with compassion for yourself and for other people. You know, being able to stand in your heart allows you to have that passion with another person. That's compassion, the passion with somebody else. So it allows me to see you in a whole different space, in a heart space. And so with that compassion, when we drop into that heart space of compassion, there's a lot more leaning towards wanting to understand what's going on for you than trying to fix what's going on for you. And all of a sudden, I just... And so one of my favorite phrases with people is that I can only imagine. Because quite honestly, I've not never had your experience about anything. And so I can only imagine how it is for you. No matter what the experience was, it's different for you. So I can only imagine. I can never say, oh, I know exactly what you mean. I don't. I really don't. I don't. So imagining is a good thing. Then there's always an invitation to go a little bit deeper. In that collaboration is that how can we go deeper? So. I'll tell you a quick story, and then I, I want to give you a chance to practice this. So I, my wife uh, was good enough to introduce me to my friend Lama Surya Das, and um, <clears throat> great guy. And we went out for a first walk together in Laguna Beach. And he asked me this question. He said, so what's the end game? What's it all about? I said, what do you, what do you mean? And he said, well, what's your goal? And I said, and like out of my mouth popped, to be a saint. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I said, I immediately went to, it must be my Catholic upbringing. You know, <laughs> I don't know why I said that. 
And he just looked at me and said, great, that's my goal too. Let's get there together. And that's been our relationship since then. He's my brother in walking towards sainthood together. But that, just a walk along the beach in a moment, you know, it wasn't some long, deep conversation. <laughs> that, what did that take, 30 seconds? <laughs> so it can be quite profound. So here's what I want to do is I want to give you a few minutes to practice this with somebody. Because let's do that now. So here's what I invite you to do is um, to share something about yourself that someone may not know at any level that you feel comfortable with. So it can be as innocuous as, um, my, my wife's name is Janet, and Diana introduced her as Karen. My twin sister's name is Karen. So I, I thought that was interesting. My real name is Earl. That's my first name. I changed my name in first grade to Kevin because we were twins. And the twins, Earl and Karen, really? Come on, parents, get a grip. So I thought, you know, I mean, you have the twins, Karen and Kevin, doesn't it? And, and do I look like an Earl? I mean, see, see, that's it. There you go. So I, first grade, Sister Kathleen Marie said, you're Earl Buck? I said, no, no, no. Kevin. So it's Kevin Buck. So ever since then. <laughs> so. So any level you want, but I want you to do is just pair off with someone, and I'm going to give you a few minutes to do this, and then we'll come back. So something you could share about yourself at any level that you feel comfortable with another person and, and practicing what you've learned this morning thus far about sacred encounters. Go. <laughs>
attention back. So go ahead and bring your attention back. I want to save a few minutes for any kind of questions or comments. Yes. You mentioned a word that really got my attention, which was when, when we have an agenda with someone uh, that we're not being genuine with that person. I, I'd love for you to elaborate a little bit about people who have an agenda uh, in every conversation. <laughs> well, I, I, I would just say that it, it's not very helpful to having a conversation. It's helpful about speaking to someone but it wouldn't be very helpful about speaking with someone. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so that, that's the distinction. Now, now, sometimes we do need to speak to someone. We need to give clear information or directions or say what it is that we want, and that's okay. That, that's fine. So, um, and more often than not, it's more helpful to do the with than the to. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, I, I always use the example, when I was raising my kids, there are some things I wanted to speak to them about, <laughs> about clear boundaries and what the rules were, and it wasn't meant to be a conversation. <laughs> there was no collaboration really about whether we were going to shift what I was thinking about the right thing to do. So that was <laughs> Yes, Andrea. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I have twin granddaughters named Madison and Mackenzie, so there you go. Um, but I wanted to say I, I need to stop and check my motive because I have to admit that sometimes I do want to say something cutting with a smile and my motive stinks. And then I realize that my, if my motive is to really tender heartedly and compassionately, my goal is to understand this person a little better then I can really bring myself into that sacred spot where what's going on with you? Even I've had so many encounters lately, like with Starbucks people. And, um, <laughs> you know, I had an encounter with, uh, he was so, so homeless. I mean, the kid was really heartbreaking. And I, when I looked in his eyes, I, I bought him something to eat. And I said, what's your name? And he said, Connor. And I said, you have to be kidding. That's my grandson's name. Ooh. And from then on, very quietly, I said, I'm going to be thinking about you today, Connor. And he said, I'm going to be thinking about you, too. And he, you know, that was my connection with this broken soul. So motive. Um, and I haven't told anyone that, even my husband, till now, because I know if I do things like that and then brag about them, it's no bueno. And also, <laughs> if I... Um, you know, I guess that's enough. I just have had epiphany shot from the sky lately, so that's my share. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. So I, I, 
in, in terms of that, one of the things I want to share is I have a good friend, Joyce, who taught me um, maybe 40 years ago. Uh, her practice was to ask any server what their name was. And so I do that. So it's not just, hey, waiter, waitress. It's, uh, hey, Mary, hey, Frank, hey, whomever. So to use their name, you know, and it, it just, it, cha it shifts the service that you get, too, by the way. So, because you're actually calling them by their name, and that's a connection. They're visible. They're visible, right. They, they know that they're seen. Well, maybe one more here, and then... So, not to labor the name thing, but what's in a name? <laughs> oh, that uh, we children could name ourselves. So, we've just had a conversation here, Marciana and I, where she didn't like her full name, and she was called Marcy. It's only recently she's come to terms with Marciano. And my name's not Jim. My given name is John. And it's a long story, but I've only just come to terms with it. Very good. So, so let, me, uh, let me bring this to a close. Uh, what I started, one of the things that I started with. You are an unrepeatable combination of God's gifts. There never has been, there isn't now, nor will there ever be anyone who has a combination of gifts that you do. Therefore, your full participation in our human community is absolutely essential. And as I learned from Ted last night, you might as well have some fun doing it. <laughs> Thank you very much.